Hi, everyone. Welcome to the University of Toronto Joint Centre for Bioethics Seminar Series. I'm Andrea Bianchi, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Our speakers are Jai Lin and Sarah Pohl, and their seminar is entitled Family Veto and Organ and Tissue Donation. Before I introduce today's speakers, I'd like to let you know that the seminar is being recorded. This lecture, along with other archived lectures, can be accessed through the Joint Centre for Bioethics website. The format of our seminar is a presentation by our speakers, followed by a facilitated discussion period. We would like to take a moment to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. We also stand in solidarity with the ongoing protests against racism and systemic discrimination. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Jai Lin is a clinical research project coordinator working with Dr. Samantha Anthony within the Child Health Evaluative Sciences Program at the Hospital for Sick Children. She completed her undergraduate degree in neuroscience and sociology at the University of Toronto and received her Master of Public Health from Queen's University. Jai is interested in equity-oriented health research through qualitative methodologies. Sarah Pohl joined the Anthony Lab as a clinical research project coordinator in September 2019. She has an undergraduate degree in health sciences and anthropology and a certificate in community development from Western University and completed her Master of Science in Global Health at McMaster University. Sarah is passionate about health equity, patient engagement, and the use of qualitative methods to illuminate the patient voice. So, Sarah and Jai, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Hello, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and present at the Joint Center for Bioethics Seminar. My name is Jai. My name is Sarah. And our presentation this afternoon is titled Family Veto in Organ and Tissue Donation. Uh, we are also pleased to have Dr. Samantha Anthony and Ms. Linda Wright on the call here with us who have been key players in this program of research. And before we begin our presentation, uh, we just like to first say that we have no conflicts of interest uh, to disclose. Oops. There we go. Uh, so this is an outline of our presentation today. We'll first uh, provide a background on organ and tissue donation in Canada and define family veto. We'll then discuss some of the key ethical considerations surrounding family veto in organ and tissue donation. Then we'll, provide, we'll, we'll present two of our research projects, a media analysis on the framing of family veto in Canada and an, an exploration into the experiences and perspectives of family veto among organ and tissue donation coordinators. And then lastly, we'll discuss the implications of family veto and next steps in our uh, program of research. So with that, I'll pass it on to Sarah now. Thank you, Jai. Organ and tissue donation involves removing organ and or tissues from one person, the donor, to give to another person, the recipient, through a transplant surgery. There are a variety of organs and tissues that can be transplanted. Looking now at the statistics of organ replacement in Canada, we see that overall, the number of or organ donors is increasing. Considering all solid organs, the deceased organ donor rate in Canada in 2019 was 21.8 donors per million population, an increase of 59% since 2010. The determination of death can be neurological, NDD, shown in the solid line, or circulatory, DCD, shown in the blue dashed line. The trend is that there are more donations from NDD compared to DCD donors. The living donor rate was 16.3 donors per million population, approximately the same as in 2010. Unfortunately, the pandemic has had a negative impact on transplantation and comparisons between organ transplants that occurred in Canada in 2019 and 2020 reveal a 16.8% reduction in the number of transplants that were performed. But we're hoping that this is only temporary. The most recent statistics available are from 2019. And in 2019, there were 820 deceased organ donors in Canada. A total of 3,014 transplant procedures were performed, 
which resulted in the transplant of 3,084 solid organs. However, there remains a shortfall of organs available for transplantation. That's 4,352 people on the waiting list for an organ transplant in 2019, of whom 249 died while awaiting an organ donor. This is a critical issue limiting the widespread implementation and effectiveness of transplantation. In Canada, there are two organ and tissue donation processes. Opt-in is a system whereby it's legally acceptable to take the deceased organs if they are registered or if they express their wish to donate their organs. Opt-out, presumed or deemed consent, is a system whereby it's legally acceptable to take the deceased's organs unless they have registered a wish not to be a donor. In other words, opted out of donation. It's interesting to note that research indicates that opt-out does not necessarily lead to higher rates of organ donation. In most of Canada, an individual's expressed or registered wish, opt-in, for organ and tissue donation is legally valid consent following death. However, Nova Scotia transitioned to the opt-out system as of January 18th of this year under the new Human Organ and Tissue Donation Act. Alberta is also in the process of transitioning to the opt-out system. On November 6, 2019, the Human Tissue and Organ Donation Presumed Consent Amendment Act passed first reading. And under this act, Alberta would transition to an opt-out program. Currently, Albertans have to opt in as organ donors. Like most of the rest of Canada, Ontario utilizes the opt-in system. Organ donation registration is a free and voluntary process available to all residents aged 16 years and older on beadonor.ca or in person at any Service Ontario location. Registration for organ donation is legally valid consent following death unless a substitute decision maker has reason to believe that the patient no longer consented. The organ procurement organization in Ontario is called Trillium Gift of Life Network. Registration for organ and tissue donation is legally valid consent following death. However, it is accepted practice for healthcare providers to seek reaffirmation for organ donation from substitute decision makers, which are often family members. In most cases, families honor their loved one's decision to donate if they have evidence that that's what their loved one wished. But in some cases, the family overrides the deceased consent to donate. And this is called family veto, and it evokes a legal and ethical tension. Legally, family veto is not permitted because the deceased's registered wish is legally binding. And ethically, it goes against the patient's autonomy, but it still occurs. One organ and tissue donor can save up to eight lives. According to Trillium Gift of Life Network, in 2019-2020, there were 72 family vetoes out of 461 registered approaches. Registered approaches, meaning that staff approached the substitute decision maker of a patient who registered their wish to donate organs. And this statistic translates to 16% of registered approaches resulting in family veto. And represents a loss of up to 250 potential transplant opportunities. Now, notably, family veto is often higher for cardiac death compared to brain death. And it's also important to note that the number of family vetoes fluctuates year to year, and at one point was as low as 11% and as high as 21%. Now we will highlight some of the ethical considerations surrounding family veto in organ and tissue donation. The first ethical consideration is the tension healthcare providers may feel between respecting the patient's autonomy and their expressed or registered wish to donate and respecting the family's wish to override the deceased's wish to donate. And in the next few slides, we'll explore this tension further. When an individual registers to be an organ and tissue donor, they do so with the understanding and expectation that their wish will be respected when they're deceased. However, when processes are not followed, it can seem like registering for organ and tissue donation is an empty and meaningless gesture. Healthcare providers have a duty to their patient, even though they are deceased, and they should honor their patient's registered wish to donate. 
Living individuals who have registered or expressed their wish to donate are also placing their trust in their future health care provider. That if a situation arises that they could be an organ or tissue donor, the appropriate steps are taken to enable and honor their wish. Donation is a significant part of an individual's legacy and ultimately how they want others to remember them. It's important that the patient-provider relationship fosters trust. However, family veto can disrupt this relationship. Registering your wish to donate is similar to creating a last will and testament. Living individuals assume that this wish and autonomy will be respected and that family members won't have the ability to interfere. In the context of organ and tissue donation, prioritizing patient autonomy means that family thoughts and opinions on the deceased's wishes are not necessarily considered. But healthcare providers do have compassion for substitute decision makers for families. They practice benevolence and non-maleficence towards all patients and all families. Families are often in situations of receiving sudden news about their loved one, and they're experiencing extreme distress. It's really about helping families when they're in this situation and showing them compassion. When healthcare providers seek reaffirmation for organ and tissue donation from families, they're acting with benevolence and non-maleficence towards the family. Some healthcare providers believe that families will experience increased distress if they do not agree with the deceased's registered wish. However, healthcare providers and hospitals have a duty to care for and respect the deceased's autonomy and act with benevolence and non-maleficence towards the patient as well. And even after the patient is deceased, care never stops, only treatment. So why does family veto happen? Why do healthcare providers, hospitals, why do they respect the family's wishes for the deceased? It's suggested that healthcare providers, hospitals, and organ and tissue donation organizations don't want to create conflict. They want to be respectful of families' opinions. On the other hand, healthcare providers, hospitals, and organ and tissue donation organizations don't want to lose the trust that patients have given them when they registered their wish to be an organ and tissue donor. It's really about a balance between respecting patient autonomy and registered wishes, as well as maintaining public trust and not having organ and tissue donation being viewed as organ snatching. As a summary, we'd like to highlight the key stakeholders involved and impacted by family veto. There's the deceased donor who consented legally to donate their organs to a recipient for transplantation. There's a substitute decision maker who vetoes the deceased donor's consent for organ donation. There's also healthcare providers such as critical care physicians, nurses, allied health professionals who care for the deceased donor. And there's the organ and tissue donation coordinators who facilitate the donation process. And Jai will discuss more about their role uh, a little bit further on. Um, but for the purpose of, of this slide, it would be important to understand that their role includes introducing organ and tissue donation to families and substitute decision makers, and also following up after organ retrieval. Of course, this diagram is not comprehensive of all stakeholders involved, and there are other stakeholders on the recipient side as well, for example, the recipient, the recipient's family, healthcare providers who care for the recipient, allied health professionals caring for the recipient, um, as well as the transplant community as a whole. But with this diagram here, what we wanted to represent again is this legal and ethical conflict and tension um, that it really exists between multiple stakeholders. So there's respect for the previously expressed wishes of the deceased donor, as well as creating um, and, and acknowledging rather the current wishes of the family. Next, we will review two of our qualitative studies exploring family veto, a media analysis, and a study investigating the experiences of organ and tissue donation coordinators in Ontario. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, so the first study that I am going to review is titled Family Veto in Organ Donation, Framing Within English Language Newspaper Articles. And the objective of this study was to investigate the portrayal of family veto in organ tissue donation in Canadian newspapers, and identify the major frames surrounding family veto that are featured most prominently in discourse in the print media. And we'd like to thank Trillium Gift of Life Network and the Canadian Donation and Transplantation Research Program uh, for their support on this program, or this project. So 
So the supply and demand of organ and tissue remains the most persistent problem in the field of organ donation and transplantation. Organ and tissue donation relies on public support and a willingness of individuals within the community to donate. Much of the public gains awareness and knowledge about health and scientific developments from the popular press. And we're currently seeing this with COVID-19 with news and updates changing rapidly and the dissemination of information and misinformation in all areas of the media. So how an issue is framed in the media can affect public discourse, shape public opinion, influence policy debates, and ultimately impact health outcomes. We can see how the tone and phrasing of a title alone can impact readers' perspectives automatically. And in the age of fast information and social media, a title can be enough to influence opinion. So these are some of the titles we saw from newspaper articles, organ donation being hindered, uh, donations lost because families allowed to veto choice, respect organ donor wishes and donor beware. And we really, we really wanted to explore the portrayal of family veto in organ and tissue donation in Canadian newspapers and ad identify some of these major frames that have featured most prominently um, in print media. So our methodology, we searched the Canadian Newsstream database, which offers access to full text of nearly 300 newspapers from Canada's leading publishers. And our inclusion criteria were English language print articles addressing family veto published between January 2000 to December 2016. And our original search strategy yielded 695 articles of which 133 met inclusion criteria. And we conducted a systematic content analysis following framing theory. So this theory emphasizes the selective presentation of specific topics, facts, controversies, and assertions in media coverage. And it was well suited for our objective. We initially conducted a preliminary analysis of the text and then identified themes and patterns that were reoccurring to create a coding framework. Uh, which we then applied to extract data from the article. So our coding categories included frequencies of coverage by newspaper and province, publication date, article type, author or, or, or article source, and who is attributed with providing information, identification of the primary framing of family veto, prevalence of family veto, reasons for family veto, ethical or legal concerns, whether the article made recommendations about uh, addressing family veto and the overall tone, positive, neutral, negative of the article. So there were 133 articles of which 72% were published in Ontario. 64% of the articles were categorized as news stories and 23% were editorials, opinion pieces and letters. And 46% of articles were written by journalists um, and this figure here shows the distribution of publication over the study period and peaks in the distribution reflect activities related to um, campaigns aimed at raising awareness about organ and tissue donation, the release of public survey data, uh, as well as proposed legislative changes. So moving on to the framing of family veto, we identified two major frames in the portrayal of family veto, family veto in articles. So first, family veto is predominantly framed as something that should not be allowed to occur in 81 articles or 70% of articles. Within this framing, the concept of a family overriding a deceased person's express wish to donate was characterized as terribly wrong, a shame, and tragic. And here we have an exemplar quote from one of the articles. So a family shouldn't be able to override a person's decision to donate organs at the time of death if they signed a card. That is like saying a dead person's will is not valid and a family can disperse belongings as they wish. So second family veto was framed as a reality that is little understood outside of the organ donation and transplantation community. And this was observed in 45 articles or 34% of articles. So newspapers conveyed the perspective that Canadians may think that by signing up to be an organ donor or expressing uh, their wish through a registry, their intentions will be honored. However, when made aware of the issue of family veto, many writers expressed dismay, surprise, bitterness, and anger um, in the in editorials, opinion pieces, and letters. And we have a few exemplar quotes here from articles. So one wrote here, 
What a shock to read that anyone, even if it is my next of kin, has the power to veto my wishes to donate organs after my death. Um, and another article wrote, I carry an organ donor card, but it's absolutely no use. So the next finding is around the legislation of family veto. And almost two thirds of articles erroneously stated or implied that existing legislation permits family veto. So one article wrote, under Ontario law, even if a donation card has been signed, family members could overrule the donor's wish when death occurs. And another article said, in Ontario, it is a law that we approach the family and obtain consent. On the other hand, around 10% of articles correctly suggested that family veto is not permitted under current legislation. So one article wrote, family members cannot legally defy a loved one's willingness to donate. Organ donors' wishes must be legally honored after death, except when a family can provide, can prove the donor changed his or her mind after signing up. And lastly, 24.1% um, of articles mentioned or highlighted ethical issues associated with family veto. And these concerns were often centered around the ethical principles of autonomy and justice. Um, ethical issues surrounding family veto were framed as infringing or violating individual rights, patient values and personal autonomy. And many of these articles also emphasize that one's personal choice in the matters of organ donation should be respected and honored even after death. So a few key takeaways. Uh, we found great variation in the coverage of the details of family veto in newspaper articles and 60% of articles framed family veto as something that should not be allowed. Um, of this, almost a quarter of articles mentioned or highlighted the ethical issues surrounding family veto, including the importance of respect for the autonomous wishes of the deceased person. And this is in line with the concept that society has a duty to enable the wishes of a person who has taken the time to register their consent um, and their autonomy even after death. We also saw variation in articles reporting whether family veto is permitted under current legislation and two thirds of articles are only erroneously suggested that family veto is allowed legally. Um, and this, of course, is an important finding that news writers and journalists um, who are responsible for communicating, you know, the current happenings of our world can misinterpret and misreport. And this is likely to have downstream impacts on organ tissue donation um, and also shape the opinions of readers. And uh, we highlight how further research is needed to enhance our understanding of family veto in Canada. And we're happy to say that this study was published in CMAJ Open in 2017. So if any of you are interested in reading more about our findings, you can uh, check up on this article. So in follow-up to the media analysis, we wanted to explore the lived experiences and perspectives of family veto uh, and individuals who have that firsthand experience with this phenomenon. So our second study is titled Family Veto and Organ Donation, the Experiences of Organ and Tissue Donation Coordinators in Ontario. And the objective of this study was to examine the experiences of organ and tissue donation coordinators who work with substitute decision makers or families who vetoed a deceased person's uh, legal consent for organ donation. And again, we'd like to thank Trillium Gifts of Life and the Canadian Donation and Transplantation Research Program for their support. So who are organ and tissue donation coordinators? Um, so they manage the approach and process of organ and tissue donation in adherence to national safety and practice guidelines. In Ontario, they are employed by Trillium Gift of Life Network, but work in various hospitals across the province. And some of their responsibilities include identifying potential donors, approaching and introducing organ and tissue donation to uh, substitute decision makers and families, and also following up with families after organ retrieval. So organ and tissue donation coordinators really are at the center of the organ donation process. They communicate with families and substitute decision makers, as well as healthcare providers to really facilitate the organ and tissue donation process. And as such, they are also key players when um, a family veto occurs. 
So our methodology, we utilized a qualitative phenomenology approach, which is a systematic inquiry into the lived experiences and meaning making activities of participants relating to a phenomenon. So in this case, family veto. We employed semi-structured focus groups with organ and tissue donation coordinators from Trillium Gift of Life Network. And participants were included if they were working as a donation coordinator for a minimum of six months and also self-reported experience with family veto. We conducted two focus groups with 10 organ and tissue donation coordinators and, her and a hermeneutic process informed our data analysis. So this really consisted of independent descriptions of uh, participants' lived experience of the family veto. And then this was shared and compared within the study group. Themes emerged and were refined through collaborative and reflexive engagement. So four primary themes emerged from our data analysis. The first we titled the significance of the organ and tissue donation coordinator role. And this was highlighted as donation coordinators reflected upon being advocates and educators in their role. Many donation coordinators emphasize their responsibility to advocate for the wishes and autonomy of the deceased donor when introducing organ donation to families. So one participant said, we're honoring the patient's decision. Yes, it's hard for the families and we're here to support them through that process and that's our role. We're advocating first and foremost for the patient always. Uh, donation coordinators also frequently became educators to families, which is important to dispel any myths surrounding organ donation. Um, and another participant said, sometimes they, being families, ask about open casket. We address it, that organ donation doesn't affect open casket viewing. And overall, donation coordinators expressed a profound sense of fulfillment in engaging with families. Um, and this highlighted a sense of job satisfaction in their role. Um, so one participant said, case of the families are great and they get inside your head and they stay with you and it's an honor to be with them. So the second theme is titled emotional distress and the understandable family veto. And as donation coordinators reflected upon their experience with family veto, um, a sort of lingering sense of emotional distress emerged. Um, so one participant shared, you sort of feel like, like one time when it happened, I just cried. I called my manager because I felt really sad about the, about the situation. The donor was registered and he had lungs. And this quote here really shows that sense of distress and almost uh, failure tied to the family veto. And we found that emotional distress often increased when substitute decision makers or families were unwavering in their decision to veto um, the deceased person's registered wish. However, this concept of an understandable family veto also emerged through analysis where donation coordinators acknowledged the situational factors influencing family decision making, um, such as trauma or sudden death or suffering um, of a loved one. So one participant said, every time I do get a family veto, it's because of a traumatic experience where it's, I understand why they are vetoing the decision. So in these cases, donation coordinators felt that they had done everything possible uh, for the deceased individual and that situational factors and family distress with all that, they, they understood why the family was vetoing. Our third theme is titled uh, Barriers Contributing to Family Veto and donation coordinators identified several barriers that challenged successful organ and tissue donation. Um, so timing was a significant barrier. And of course, organ donation is a time sensitive process. It demands timely identification of uh, and referral of potential donors, as well as a timely initiation of the donation conversation with family members. And in our study, donation coordinators discussed how limited time and the prolonged donation process impacted decision-making around authorization. So one participant said, Substitute decision makers are in support of it, but as soon as you start exploring how long this is going to take on top of what they've already been through, they just want to get from where they are to the end point very, very quickly. Um, another finding was that donation coordinators identify a perceived ambivalence from healthcare providers towards organ donation, in that healthcare providers are sometimes less enthusiastic about making donation referrals. And donation coordinators attributed this ambivalence from healthcare providers to rare but influential experiences um, caring for transit recipients. So one participant said, it's really tough. 
A lot of the nurses who care for the transplant patients that don't do well, they're really jaded. A lot of them, they only see the bad stuff. And when it's bad, it's really ugly. So lastly, donation coordinators identified several strategies that could facilitate a culture of organ donation. Many donation coordinators cited using value positive language when communicating with families. And this is a method that emphasizes that the deceased donors desire um, their autonomy and their consent to donate. Uh, so the one, one participant said, we'll use the wording, we can honor their wish. We know this is their wish. They're registered and they've obviously put a lot of thought into this. There are also calls for public education around organ and tissue donation um, as donation coordinators saw a lot of misinformation. So one participant said, like in Grey's Anatomy, the episode's done in an hour. It makes it hard to kind of argue because that's probably the public's perception of it. And lastly, donation coordinators spoke about having open conversations about end of life wishes with family members and friends and really mainstreaming these conversations into everyday life. Um, so one said, have a conversation at your family doctor, have a talk in schools when they're all in grade 12. They need to know you've got to be on a ventilator. They need to know these things. And a culture of organ donation could potentially prepare families to anticipate the donation conversation um, when they are approached. And this could also support um, their grieving and healing processes uh, for the deceased donor. So in conclusion, and a few key takeaways from our study, family veto represents a legal and ethical conflict between respect for the previously uh, wish, the previous wishes of the uh, previous wishes of the deceased donor, as well as the currently expressed wishes of the, the family or the substitute decision maker. And it also places organ and tissue donation coordinators in a difficult ethical position. And our findings of increased distress among donation coordinators during a family veto really highlight this ethical and moral conflict. Uh, donation coordinators were conscious of the morally appropriate action for the deceased individual in respecting their registered wish to donate, but couldn't carry out that action because of the family veto or other barriers that challenged um, or that facilitated family veto. Additionally, our findings of the acceptable family veto show that there are some cases where situational factors may dissolve some of this distress uh, for organ and tissue donation coordinators. Um, and in these cases, they felt that they had done as much everything possible to advocate for the wishes of the deceased individual. So our findings highlight important ethical considerations about organ donation authorization processes in Ontario specifically around waiting times for families of potential donors, as well as need for enhanced organ donation public education. And there is also a clear need for collaborations within or with all the stakeholders to align healthcare practices, organ and tissue donation policies, and education initiatives. So we are happy to share that this study was recently published in the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia in earlier this year, 2021. And along with this publication also uh, was an editorial titled Much Ado About the Family Veto. And this editorial really echoed much of our ethical, uh, much, much of the ethical considerations uh, in this presentation surrounding family veto, but it further emphasized the importance of patient autonomy. The authors maintain that when an individual takes the time to register their consent to donate their organs, healthcare providers have an ethical duty to care for the patient and respect the registered wish even after death. And in this context, family distress alone is argued to be insufficient to override the deceased wishes. The editorial makes several recommendations about ways to improve the organ and tissue donation process. And one of those was are, one of those is surrounding the ask when introducing organ and tissue donation to families. Um, so discussions with families regarding organ and tissue donation should emphasize that donation coordinators are informing families of the patient wishes, um, not seeking reconsent. And we are seeing some of these practices um, in today. So with that, I'm gonna pass it along to Sarah now who's gonna talk about some of the structural implications of family veto. Policy gaps within provincial healthcare systems permit family veto. Research suggests organ and tissue donation organizations do support the accepted practice of healthcare providers 
seeking reaffirmation for organ and tissue donation from substitute decision makers, either by implicitly or explicitly indicating that substitute decision makers' wishes should be followed. In our media analysis, we suggest that there is a misunderstanding and misrepresentation of legislation and whether or not family veto is legally permitted. The lack of strict definitions or guidelines on this highly emotional issue supports and creates an environment that allows family veto to occur. It will be interesting to see the long-term implications of Nova Scotia's opt-out system. In terms of family veto in Ontario, there needs to be clearly defined guidelines and communication of these guidelines in practice. This variability and in inconsistency in interpretation of legislations also permits clinical practice and it impacts clinical practice and the ability to regulate clinical practice. As explored in our presentation of ethical issues pertaining to organ donation and transplantation, and specifically family veto, healthcare providers, hospitals, and organ and tissue donation organizations have to balance interpersonal trust, trust between them and the patient, as well as public trust, trust between them and the public. Healthcare providers and hospitals and organ and tissue donation organizations are always acting with benevolence and non-maleficence towards both the family and the patient, and they should respect the patient's wish while still showing compassion to the family. Perhaps the variability in practice makes the decision-making process more difficult for all stakeholders involved. Public trust of organ donation and transplantation and public perceptions is another structural factor. Consent for organ donation does depend on public support and a willingness to donate. A recent survey from the Canadian Transplant Society found that while 90% of Canadians supported organ donation, only 20% were registered donors. This not only speaks for the need for organ donation registration initiatives, but also highlights the importance of individuals having conversations with family members and friends following registration in order to help indicate their strengths and their intention about donating their organs. It's not only about increasing organ donation, but also increasing public trust in the system and processes involved. Lastly, education. And education is tied closely to public perception. In the family veto study, donation coordinators suggested increased education to raise awareness of these issues and also mainstreaming donation and end-of-life wishes into everyday conversations. And we're seeing some of these initiatives across Ontario. There are a number of initiatives in London, Ontario, for example. And here at SickKids, the high school outreach initiative was launched in 2011. The initiative involved classroom presentations delivered by transplant healthcare professionals and the transplant recipient, where they visit high schools in the GTA and talk directly to students about organ donation and transplantation. Afterwards, students are encouraged to continue these conversations and share what they've learned with their family and friends. There are a number of areas that would benefit from future research. And our next steps are to investigate other stakeholders' experiences of family veto, including the perspectives of stakeholders, substitute decision makers, family members, healthcare providers working in the ICU, and organ and tissue donation coordinators working across Ontario and Canada more broadly. And thank you to all our partners, collaborators and research team members for your support and guidance throughout the research journey. And I think with that, we're gonna open the floor up for questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, Jai and Sarah for the very thought provoking presentation. Um, so it is time for questions and discussion via the YouTube chat. And so if anyone is logged into YouTube, of course, you can use the chat in order to put forward your question. If you want to send in a question anonymously, then you can send an email to Lori Bolchak and her email address is in the YouTube chat as well. And so there are a number of questions that have already come in. And so the first question is, how does Canada's organ donation rate compare to other countries and do any government policies enable or inhibit this rate? Ooh, good question. Um, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but I do know Canada falls kind of in the middle among, uh, I wanna say like OEDC countries. 
uh, and that's both for living and deceased. I don't know if Linda or Samantha has more uh, concrete, uh, concrete answer to this. Um, so I, I haven't seen very recent uh, numbers, but uh, I believe we're not at the top, but not, not too far down the, the uh, not too far near the bottom. Um, policies, um, the, the policies are mostly provincial. So it's hard to talk about a, like a Canadian policy. Um, so each, as you saw, some, um, most provinces have the um, opt-in system and Nova Scotia has just recently moved to, to the opt-out. So um, it really lies between uh, the, it, it lies with the province. Well, thank you so much. Okay, so I will move on to the next question. It, this one it comes from Louise Schwartz who asks, do physicians seek reaffirmation of organ donation from families or substitute decision makers after an individual's death by medical assistance in dying? So that is to say, is family veto a possibility after a planned donation after made? A very um, interesting question. Um, Linda, I'm not sure if you might have some, some information on that. Uh, so it, we are in fact doing organ donation after made. And if you think about it, it is the clearest and most certain consent that we get in this context because the person who is seeking maid has had an opportunity to have a very full discussion um, and to talk about uh, all the aspects of uh, being a, a donor. Um, what we, uh, so would there be a family veto? Uh, there is the opportunity to inform the family beforehand that this is uh, what is planned. Um, this would not be something that could be done in the home. It would have to be done in a hospital in order to enable the uh, organ uh, retrieval to, to happen very shortly um, after the person had died. Um, so I think the family veto, I haven't heard of it happening in that situation. I think it's much less likely to happen. And of course, the staff would be aware of the fact that um, it, it would be optimal for the family to be aware of that wish before uh, the maid was actually carried out. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I'm valuing this collaborative approach given this complex topic. Mm -hmm. The third question comes from Neil Lazar who asks, does this really fall under the Healthcare Consent Act or substitute decision making or substitute, I guess, substitute decisions act? If yes, why shouldn't families or substitute decision makers be allowed to change this advanced directive? They're allowed to do this with respect to other treatment decisions. So I guess this is just to ask that if actually organ donation and making decisions about it actually does fall under the Healthcare Consent Act, and if there are substitute decision makers consulted, then why shouldn't they be permitted the same rights that they do when it comes to other advanced directives? Okay, you want me to have a go at this? <laughs> um, I, I, I don't think it, it does fall under the Health Care Consent Act because the person is dead. Um, I think it falls under uh, the, in, in Ontario, the Trillion Gift of Life Act, which has a very slightly different um, uh, hierarchy of, of the people who can, um, it, who can authorize the taking of the organs or not. So uh, I think that answers the question. Thank you. Okay. And Jed Gross asks or comments, mentions under the Ontario Act, first person authorization is valid unless there is, quote, reason to believe the donor has withdrawn consent. Have you seen any attempts to distinguish between, one, vetoes based on surviving family members' values and wishes versus objections that are based on family members' asserted knowledge of the donor's own values and wishes. Mm -hmm. So in other words, um, has this, this idea that we don't agree to donation based on our own values versus our loved one wouldn't have agreed to that. Have you seen this or has this come up in any of your, your work? 
I can answer this question. Um, so we didn't really see that in our focus groups with the donation coordinators um, in that most of the vetoes or the reasons for vetoes was that they were, it was, um, they were in like a very intense, distress, distressful situation where it's pretty difficult to make a decision. Um, some vetoes were definitely situational and that family members um, were thinking about other things and had other places to go. Um, but yeah, it is like in, in the law, it is that you can, you know, if, if the deceased person had in some way expressed that they did not want to consent for anymore or did not want to donate their organs, um, that is reasonable grounds to kind of not, uh, not go forward with the donation. And maybe I'll just, um, add in that um, any discussions I've had with Trillian Gift of Life, which, which at this point are a little dated, I've been retired for five years, um, uh, they have always emphasized that if the family could show um, reasonable um, evidence that the person had changed their mind, and we don't always write these things down, or we might say, you know, oh yeah, I should get around to changing that uh, notification, and we don't always, I mean, that's just human nature. Um, but uh, that, that will be taken very seriously. There, there is every attempt to respect the person's last known capable wishes. Yeah, and I also wanted to add in on that. I think, I think it does highlight our key point of um, encouraging individuals when they do register to talk and to speak with their families or their subsidy decision makers on this topic so that you know families know that this is their wish. And I think research shows that, you know, the most consistent predictor of a successful organ donation is that families um, know, of, know of their wishes uh, prior to their death. So, and then if, if also they decided to change their decision, again, kind of making sure that the family or your decision maker knows about your decisions. Thank you so much. Another question comes from Lynn Sargent who asks, you've mentioned balancing issues between the patient wishes and family, but I'm curious about how benevolence and non-maleficence is worked into the equation when it comes to the potential recipient. So thinking about those two principles in relation to how a potential recipient may benefit or may be harmed. Well, it, I mean, that's a very good point, but we cannot do things to a potential donor based on what it will do. Um, well, some things, uh, ultimately we can't go around taking organs from people because there's a recipient who would need it. I mean, look at the numbers on the list. We cannot do that. So it has to, the, the what's referred to as procuring, uh, of the organs or the retrieval of the organs has to be done under certain conditions and circumstances. And those are very strongly in favor of respecting uh, the wish of the uh, person who has died and, um, and, and of it being a voluntary act. Thank you for that. And actually, I'm going to insert myself here because I think that one of the questions I had, which I think is it very much stems from what you were just mentioning, Linda, is around this idea about ownership. And did you find in any of your readings or just in any of your research around this topic that families were of the impression, rightly or wrongly, I'm not certainly commenting on that, but that families were of the impression that they were the owners of this deceased person's organs and not the deceased person themselves because they are deceased. Uh, Jai or Sarah, do you want to address yeah. that? Mm -hmm. um, not that I like read of or know of, of course there is pretty limited research out there exploring the family's perspective or substitute decision makers perspective. Um, of family veto. So um, I, yeah, I haven't read anything about it. Didn't really come up in our research, um, but I think a future step in our research program would be to interview some family members and see 
um, kind of explore their reasoning, their perspectives, their experience on, on family veto and um, see ways that we could perhaps support them better um, in the future. Not that I've come across um, either, but I think it also um, kind of the ownership aspect speaks to uh, thinking of um, organ and tissue donation and, and registered wishes, um, similarly to uh, a will, for example, um, and and how and so one way would be to think of it that way in terms of the the, um, the ownership or the possession. Um, but definitely an area for, for future research. Linda, I'm not sure if you had any other comments as well. Um, well, it, it's a very interesting uh, aspect of this. Um, and uh, Janet Radcliffe Richards in Oxford has written somewhat about this, about how, the fact that uh, looking back in history, the um, deposition of a body uh, was basically given over to families, mostly because of respect for religious beliefs and that which very much influence how a body is um, laid to rest. Um, but then we do have things like the organ or uh, the Trillium Gift of Life uh, Donation Act or Trillium Gift of Life Act, uh, I think it's called, um, which, you know, are more recent and, and they do address this. Organs are not an bodies are not treated in property law. They, they, we talk not about who owns them, but about who controls them. And not being a lawyer, I cannot get into any details on the real significance of all of that, um, but property law apparently does not apply to it. So um, I, I, I think it is, uh, I think there are lots of shades uh, uh, of, of this whole um, aspect of, of uh, organ donation. Definitely a lot of shades. Thank you for entertaining my question. Um, I will go back to the list. So there's a comment that was made uh, from Lori Evespin who says, sharing our wishes assists family in understanding. And if there isn't family agreement, maybe the individual needs to have an alternate be their decision maker at the end of life and after death. I know that my next of kin agrees. Great presentation team. Um, and then Rink de Vries um, asks, has there ever been a legal challenge to a family veto, perhaps by another family member? I don't know of one. Uh, I don't know if, if uh, Sarah or Jai, uh, uh, um, you know, if uh, I think if a discussion among a family had become that difficult, uh, I really don't think that uh, the organs would be taken, but, but I'm, that's just, I, I, I'm not there at those discussions and I, I really uh, don't know the um, ICU staff would possibly have a, a, a better under, a better knowledge of that. Yeah, I also haven't heard of any cases of uh, families suing hospitals over this. Um, but I do know that there is research out there suggesting um, in terms of, you know, physician non-referral for donation, some of their concerns have been being sued by hospitals and kind of having that negative light on the organ donation system and the organ donation community. Um, yeah. Thank you. And the next question or comment, um, I think question, um, it is anonymous and says, was the following a concern among ODT coordinators at all? And then this is the, this is the comment or a potential concern. So the beadonor.ca website makes it possible to register someone else as an organ donor without their knowledge if you have their Ontario health card number even though the website says you should only register yourself. Are all online registrations cross-referenced with consent that it's registered on the person's health card? My concern is that family members can register other family members or remove consent on, uh, online without the actual person's consent. So what is assumed to be honoring the prospective deceased donor's wishes um, is based on trust, it, it seems, that the patient registered themselves. Oh, dear. That's a great um, question, question and comment. Um, not something that uh, we've kind of looked into or that, that came up um, when we were um, speaking with organ and tissue donation coordinators, but um, I would think definitely an area of concern. 
and um, perhaps perhaps an area of future research as well. Yeah, it's something that also, oh, and here's Linda, something that I also hadn't considered. Linda, I'm not sure if you heard this last, that last question, if you did want to weigh in. You're on mute now. Um, I'm sorry, I missed it. I'm sorry, it was a phone call. That's okay. No, the question was just really that, you know, anyone can register someone else yes. if they have their Ontario Health Card number. And so is there any verification process that is implemented to make sure it actually is the person themselves who's registered? Or do we just trust that the person registered themselves? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I did not know that. Um, we'd have to ask Trillium Gift of Life. Uh, I mean, there's no other... Uh, they handle this. Uh, I'm shocked. I didn't know that. I did not know that. <laughs> it should That should not. Who has your health card? It's not that hard to get somebody's health card number. Yeah, yeah. That's a very good question that uh, is certainly thought provoking. Um, well, with that, and I think that that's a wonderful, very thought provoking question to be, you know, for all of us to be thinking about and just given the time as well. Um, I do certainly want to thank our speakers. Um, it is time to draw the seminar to a close. So I have a couple of announcements to make and then we will certainly formally thank you. Um, so letting everyone know that our next event will be the eighth annual Ross Upshur Lecture on Public Health Lecture. Uh, on public health ethics on Wednesday, April 7th, where Sally Bean, Brian Schwartz, and Allison Thompson will be discussing examining tensions in public health ethics, reflections from COVID-19. And the lecture will be moderated by Dr. Maxwell Smith, and so, of course, to sign up to receive our weekly seminar reminder emails, please feel free to email jcb.info at utoronto.ca and CSB students enrolled in the CSB student seminars course. Uh, please do remember to keep track of your attendance. And so on behalf of everyone on YouTube and who will watch this presentation in the future, um, I do just want to send a sincere thank you to you, Jai and Sarah, um, and also Linda and uh, Samantha for, for, for all of your work and for this very, very wonderful presentation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.